All right, Isaiah 46, let's call this one purpose, Stockholm, referring to Stockholm Syndrome, something we've talked about in chapters and books before, but let's talk about it again. Understanding that Stockholm Syndrome can refer to a condition where someone who is captive or oppressed can fall in love or be unnaturally uh, attracted to their oppressor or their captor in spite of that oppressor or captor's flaws. Understanding that that seems to be the situation where Israel finds itself here in chapter 46, where my chapter title says, the idols of Babylon and the one true God. Verse one, talking about Bel and Nebo. And I was at least able to look up Nebo to find out that it was a Chaldean God whose worship was introduced into Assyria by Pul. I don't necessarily know who Pul is, but I do know that the Chaldeans a large province associated with Babylon that eventually became a term for Babylon because of their influence in the nation. So sometimes the Chaldeans are essentially synonymous with the Babylonians, thus the chapter title that I have here in chapter 46 in the ESV. Going on though, it's going to seem to suggest that their newfound affection or apparent affection for the gods of Babylon is misplaced because verse two is going to say that they themselves are about to go into captivity, understanding that the previous chapter, chapter 45, is actually, as we mentioned, God talking to their replacement, Cyrus, king of Persia. As verses three and four are going to call them to listen and call their attention back to the fact that God is still planning to save them in verse four. However, if they are not able to overcome the misery of their current condition, they are going to forget that their captivity is not forever. God prophesying, at least by the time of Isaiah, that it's to last only 70 years. And if they lose track of the fact that it's not forever, they will likely be even more tempted to grope for different gods. Gods that are fiction and flat out can't save them as God in verses five through seven is going to turn their attention back to a fundamental dilemma. And that is, if you wanted to go back to cooking up gods on your own, what blueprint are you actually going to be able to use? Understanding that back in chapter 40, he gave them an illustration of how much larger he is than anything that they are able to conceive, drawing on the illustration that we used of the Queen of Sheba going to meet Solomon, saying that as grandiose as the tales were, the half had not been told to her because when she finally got to meet Solomon and see Israel at its height, it was more than she had actually imagined. Thus, chapter 46 shows God once again posing the question to them, what are you going to use for a blueprint to actually try to design a legitimate God that can actually save? As he will go on in verses 8 through roughly 10 to call them to remember things that he is told them before in previous chapters even that we have seen that there is no other and so much like he might have cautioned Cyrus you can look around but try not to use valuable time that can be devoted to progress looking into faulty alternatives God reminding them in verse 10 my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose consistent with our title as he will conclude the chapter in verses 12 and 13 seemingly saying it's not that complicated even as much as they seem to be complicating it he's going to say they are far from righteousness even though in verse 13 he will say i bring my righteousness it is not far off begging the question is righteousness actually what they want this chapter seeming to remind us of the way in which their search for a God that would bring them success without regard for right or wrong is leading them into the captivity of a nation that exists without regard for right or wrong. As they likewise seem to be falling in love with the idols of that nation.